What is the mind capable of perceiving? What is our perception of what we understand to be the spiritual realm? A spiritual realm that we know exists biblically. We do have limitations, obviously. Many people are describing uh, alternate realities, a multiverse uh, realm that we're not consciously aware of. And we know that the mind can perceive reality around it. The Bible says when the body dies, the spirit continues. There's more to the spiritual realm in terms of time and perception, especially when we see how the Bible talks about the past, the present, and the future. In fact, some scientists are working on theories that uh, explain how there may be multiple universes or parallel universes. The problem with these theories is they're not considering time. You see, as humans, our perception of time is very limited. We're used to beginnings, you're born, we're used to ends, you die. Our entire lives run on the clock. We're either ahead of time or we're behind in time. We're looking forward to a time. We think about uh, the calendar. There are days. And these are things that God created. And it makes sense that only humans would be able to have that limitation. Because one of the very interesting things is that God created time. And uh, that he not only created it, but he can see through time. And in fact, he can see every moment in time at the same time. He has no limitation whatsoever with regard to time. When scientists are observing uh, things like quantum matter, the erratic nature of what they have seen leads them to believe that there are other laws in place that they still don't know about. So whether it's a multiverse or an astral plane, the human mind is consistently and always bound by time. When spiritual progression is part of your lifestyle, God is going to take you places. And there's a reason for that. It's because God wants to see us in his spiritual realm. Now, an amazing thing happens when you have faith in Jesus our spirit begins to merge into God's timeline. This guides us along God's spiritual path that he's already determined. God's word tells us that God is the author of life. 
it's like we are already characters within a book that God has already written. Psalm 139, verse 16 reads, Your eyes saw me, and I was formless. All my days were written in your book and planned before a single one of them began. What this psalmist is talking about is a a difference between the way God views time and the way we do. We're already thought of before we even understood what time was. So if we're understanding this correctly, then we recognize that God foreordains or he's got it all figured out even before it happens. At Isaiah 46.10, God says, I declare the end from the beginning and from long ago what is not yet done, saying, my plan will take place and I will do all my will. You see, God's already seen this through to its end, to its conclusion. We're just on a single page. We don't see everything that God sees. Why concern ourselves with the future? God's already set in motion what he has preordained. God's got a plan. He's got a plan for the earth. He's got a plan for you. He has a purpose for all things that he has created. There's no question God has a good plan for you. What's amazing is that we can enter into his timeline and watch it all happen. We're talking about a plan that is so important to your life because it will bring about happiness and peace because it, it's, a, it's a good plan. Romans 8.28 says, We know that all things work together for the good of those who love God, who are called according to His purpose. There is some tension between our human experience and God's divine promise, but we know one thing for sure, that it's always his ultimate good that will prevail. We look at the Pharisees, we know that they were really far from serving God. They even had Jesus crucified. They weren't comprehending Jesus' teaching, let alone had any interest in following him. Luke chapter 7 kind of proves the point. Jesus is teaching and the Pharisees just weren't getting it. They simply just didn't believe Jesus. So in Luke chapter 7, Jesus is teaching about the baptism of John and many were accepting this, but the Pharisees, it says in verse 30, The experts of the law had not been baptized by John, and so they rejected the plan of God for themselves. This was the moment in time that God was waiting for and knew would happen, that these Pharisees would refuse to accept Jesus' teaching, and that it would be part of God's purpose that Jesus would die for our sins. God even had a purpose for the Pharisees to reject Jesus' words. This was another page in the book that God had already written that would lead to our salvation, the crucifixion of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. So the Pharisees are playing the the bad guy in God's book and his plan. And the idea to keep in mind is that you cannot stop that plan. That it will the ultimate fulfillment in Jesus Christ had to occur. These things were declared even before the foundations of the world. God knew in his infinite wisdom down the corridors of time 
what things would influence these Pharisees to make that decision. We are constantly being bombarded by our thoughts and other elements outside of our sphere of existence that influence our decisions consistently and that because of that influence then God sees which character we're going to play within that book the book that he's already written we're all trapped within the timeline of God even though an atheist doesn't believe in God they're still trapped within the story they might think that they're free to choose but God has already written that at the end times there are going to be those who reject him see everybody is trapped within God's timeline notice Proverbs chapter 16 3 and 4. Commit your activities to the Lord and your plans will be established. The Lord has prepared everything for his purpose, even the wicked for the day of disaster. And it is even written how that's all going to end for the wicked. The Bible helps us to understand a little deeper what spiritual progression is it describes God like a potter Paul helps us to understand that uh, not every vessel will hold water some are prepared for good and some are prepared for destruction it's a tough message Paul explains this in Romans chapter 9 21 through 23 he says or has the potter no right over the clay to make from the same lump one piece of pottery for honor and another for dishonor? And what if God, wanting to display his wrath and to make his power known, endured with much patience object of wrath prepared for destruction? And what if he did this to make the riches of his glory on the objects of mercy that he prepared beforehand for glory. So the two characters are plainly noted here. There are those that are objects of God's wrath. Those are the ones that are headed towards destruction. And then there are those that are the objects of his mercy. The question is, which character are you in this story? We're trapped in this timeline, and now we're awaiting God to reveal to us which character we are. The point that Paul is making here is that God, in his infinite wisdom, has set into motion the order of all things, including the character that we are called to be. Some are prepared by God as his objects of glory. We don't even have the ability to make a choice to be the object of God's glory, let alone refuse his calling to follow him. You see, for some of us, his invitation is irresistible. So it's quite clear that not every object that God creates has a good purpose. Paul explains how we're influenced and how God already knows which type of object we are. Nevertheless, God's solid foundation stands firm, bearing this inscription, The Lord knows those who are His, and let everyone who calls on the name of the Lord turn away from his wickedness. Now in a large house, there are not only gold and silver vessels, but also those of wood and clay, some for honorable use and some for dishonorable use. So if anyone purifies himself from anything dishonorable, he will be a special instrument, set apart, useful to the master, prepared for every good work. Flee from youthful passions and pursue 
righteousness, faith, love, and peace, along with those who call on the Lord from a pure heart. The Spirit of God then influences us so that we have the desire to want to do good works, to turn to God and to be a vessel of honor. By the empowerment of the Holy Spirit, we're going to care about those things that God loves and pursue righteousness. We're going to flee the youthful passions. So here's the question then. How do I know that God has chosen me to be a vessel of honor? What really proves that I am? Well, if we look into God's book, then we can find some really great examples of how you can know that you are chosen of God. In the story of Joseph, he wanted to follow God's plan, but his brothers threw him into a pit. He was sold into slavery. He went to prison. And through all of that, it was God's plan that he became a ruler in Egypt. The result being that he saved his entire family from famine. So we see that when we're within God's timeline, that everything that occurs to us is a setup for his good purpose. Being trapped in God's timeline is not a bad thing. In fact, the best part of that is that he extends this opportunity to continue on in his timeline forever. This is absolutely an amazing future, that one that only God could provide. When we have a spiritual perception of God's timeline, we recognize that it doesn't matter where we're at, What's important is where we're going. Paul defines what this spiritual progression is at Galatians in the 16th verse of chapter 5, where he says, So I say to you, walk in the Spirit, and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. For the flesh desires what is contrary to the Spirit, and the Spirit what is contrary to the flesh. They are in conflict with each other so that you are not to do whatever you want. Paul goes on to explain what the acts of the flesh are and they're, that they're obvious. They're sexual immorality, impurity, debauchery, idolatry and witchcraft, hatred, discord, jealousy, fits of rage, selfish ambition, uh, dissension factions and envy and drunkenness and orgies and the like and he says well I warn you as I did before that those who live like this will not inherit the kingdom of God Paul's helping us to understand that as believers these things are not a way of life then Paul explains that we know that there is a spiritual progression enacting upon us when we start to see the fruit of the Spirit, which is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, kindness, goodness, mildness, faith, self-control. He says against such things there is no law. When the Spirit of God is leading you, He's ordering your steps in every good way. And I mean everything, even the little things. Holy Spirit isn't a list of rules, it's God's compass entering into the timeline that he has created. It's God's expression of his holiness, giving us ideas of every little thing that we know he would be pleased with. God is aligning us with his plan, using his compass on his timeline so that we understand how we should behave before a great and holy God. In every circumstance that we find ourselves in, God is telling us what to do and what not to do. In fact, the word says, since we live by the Spirit, let us keep in step with the Spirit.
then Paul really brings it home by helping us to understand that all who are led by the Spirit of God are sons of God. You can come along and say you're a follower of God, but the true Christians are those that are moving. They're progressive in their spirituality. They're training themselves to truly walk in His Spirit. Spiritual progression is the idea of committing to what God has already preordained and allowing ourselves to fall within those actions. That's when you see that you're actually walking with God and that He's acting around us. It's living out the pages of the book that He has written. We're recognizing the will of God by aligning ourselves with the compass that He has placed on His timeline. In chapter 12 of Hebrews, the writer tells us that we should lay aside every hindrance and the sin that so easily ensnares us, and that we should run the race with endurance, the race that is marked out before us. Yes, marked out by God. So we give glory to God because we know He's the one that has carried us through. Spiritual progression on God's timeline means that, like Paul, we can say the words, I have fought the good fight. I've finished the race. I've kept the faith. Now there is in store for me the crown of His righteousness. Righteousness.